Excellencies, uh, distinguished delegates, participants, dear colleagues, I uh, would like to welcome you to this uh, FAO in Geneva Fisheries Trade Talks uh, session today, organized in collaboration with our colleagues from the FAO uh, Fisheries and, uh, and Aquaculture Division. And we appreciate your support and interest in FAO's work. And uh, as you uh, already know, uh, when it comes to trade, FAO supports its member efforts to formulate policies conducive to improved food security by strengthening evidence and analysis. We provide capacity uh, development and we facilitate a neutral dialogue away from the negotiating table. Uh, last year, um, also because of what you achieved at the MC12, uh, we included the, the topic of fisheries in our trade talks, which were up to that point focused on, on agriculture. And uh, we, we added fisheries um, to enhance the understanding of the current state of global fisheries and aquaculture, as well as to inform on the existing and emerging FAO knowledge and tools for transforming aquatic food systems and promoting uh, their responsible and sustainable management. Now, let me share a couple of points uh, regarding today's topic. The 2030 Agenda, as you know, uh, emphasizes the importance of regional dimensions, economic integration, and interconnectivity towards sustainable uh, development. Today, our world is facing various challenges, uh, exacerbated by the over-exploitation of natural resources, the impact of climate change with a compound effects on food security and power. Therefore, establishing the collaborative and cooperative uh, framework to promote global cooperation and foster international and regional initiatives to secure responsible and sustainable fisheries and aquaculture is more relevant than ever. Promoting cooperative fisheries and aquaculture governance can provide opportunities to address common concerns with a common basis and requirements, create synergies, mainstream global objectives, improve capacities and functioning identify good practices and work efficiently for sustainable uh, development. With this background, this edition of the FAO and Geneva Fisheries Trade Talks will provide an opportunity to elaborate on the role of the Regional Fisheries Management Organization on ocean governance in general and fisheries sustainability in particular, including their role in supporting the implementation of the WTO Agreement on Fisheries Subsidies adopted last year at the WTO MC12. Today's session is actually taking place in a very timely context in terms of ocean governance and conservation of fisheries resources. Let me remind you in that context of some of the important dates observed or which will be observed this month uh, in terms of oceans and uh, sustainability. As you were very well know, on the 5th of June, uh, we have been observing the International Day of the Fight Against Illegal, Unreported and Unregulated Fishing. On 8 June, the World Ocean Day was celebrated. This week will mark the first anniversary of the WTO Agreement on Fisheries Subsidies adopted last year at the 12th Ministerial Conference. Next week, very importantly, and uh, Pierrot reminded me of that, uh, the Intergovernmental Conference on an International Legally Binding Instrument under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea on the Conservation and Sustainable Use of Marine Biological Diversity of Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction will be concluded, will conclude its work with the adoption of the agreement in New York. I also believe that today's session will be instrumental in informing members in their efforts in relation to the WTO agreement on fisheries subsidies and in the second wave of negotiation ongoing to achieve a comprehensive agreement. Now let me really go to the point where, where you, why you all came to this and to hear from our speakers. And, uh, and first, uh, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Mr. Piero Manini. Uh, uh, Mr. Manini is a senior officer in the FAO Fisheries and Aquaculture Division. And uh, Ms. Aurora Mateos 
uh, with a fisheries policy and international institution expert in fisheries and aquaculture, in, also in the fisheries and aquaculture division at FAO reporter in Rome. Uh, Piero and Aurora, of course, we are very happy to, uh, to have you with us today. And I should say that Piero, uh, for those who are following the MC12, Piero was working for over a year, uh, eight months, with uh, WTO in preparing for the, the first agreement which you, uh, which you reached last year. So he was based here for some time. Uh, today, we will also, uh, we are also very pleased to be, to be joined virtually. Uh, by uh, Mr. Camille um, Manel. Mr. Manel is the Executive Secretary of the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, ICAT, and by Mr. Alastair McFarlane. Uh, Mr. McFarlane is the Senior International Fisheries Advisor at the Min Ministry for Primary Industries of New Zealand. Uh, we'd like to welcome both of you uh, very warmly and a special thank to Mr. McFarlane who is joining from New Zealand and therefore it's already late uh, there in that part of the world. Before uh, giving the floor to Piero and Aurora, I would like to, to share with you the usual uh, housekeeping uh, thing uh, to say that, of course, this is an hybrid event. Uh, we have about 50 participants uh, online uh, today. Uh, uh, and this is through the, the Zoom platform. The event will be in English only with no interpretation. Uh, we have reserved, of course, some time at the end of the, of the session, and we would like to invite you to ask your question using the Q&A uh, module, uh, of course, indicating uh, your affiliation. And we'll try to accommodate as many questions as possible uh, before the end of the session. So that's it from my part. And now I would like to, to give the the floor to uh, Piero and, uh, and Aurora uh, for, the, for their presentation. Piero, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. And thank you for uh, the kind invitation. Uh, we are really very happy and pleased to be here with you. Uh, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, colleagues, uh, so good morning or good afternoon or good evening. And um, it's a pleasure just to share with you this presentation on uh, basically focus on the role of the regional fisheries management organization which now i'll try to share my screen which is always a critical moment but at least it's it. <laughs> okay this is my today okay i hope that is yeah very well. So the, the topic of the presentation is uh, the marine areas behind national jurisdiction and the role of regional fisheries management organization. And uh, I would like also to add the role of FAO in supporting and working with regional fisheries management organization. This presentation will be prepared by Aurora Mateus and myself. So I start with something. Uh, the power is familiar to the most of you, just to refresh our mind. These are the maritime zones, according to the UN clause. If you see from uh, this uh, um, picture, from the left to the right, you can see, of course, the territorial sea, and then which are under full sovereignty of coastal states, then uh, the economic exclusive zone up to 300 miles that may be and extended to include the so-called extended continental shelf. And then after that, the IC, which is uh, uh, the topic of our uh, talk uh, today. Again, fishery resources, I mean, are all across the system and they support, uh, um, and they support uh, therefore uh, relevant fisheries. And then you can see, I mean, I hope this uh, uh, slide is quite clear. We have, with the first red circle, the case of uh, the typical highly migratory species, the tuna. They're able to migrate over large areas in the IFC as well as uh, in areas within national jurisdiction. Then you have another typology, which is the Australian species uh, with extensive distribution, in this case, uh, with the case of uh, some shark species. 
species with number three that only occur in, occur in the IC and support fisheries in the IC, as in this case of the Mercer resources. Then the typical pelagic strand uh, species, say so some case of sardines, just to give you an example, the mostly within the IZ, but also moving according to the life cycle and the number of parameters also into uh, the IC. Then uh, the MERSA stratum species, the MERSA meaning those species that do not live, they are not pelagic, they do not live within the water column, but they live in the co having contact with the bottom of, of the sea, and then in the case. Then uh, in uh, number six, uh, you have the case of squids, and uh, so when I say squid, you have to consider the squid fisheries, that uh, transboundary stocks, as you can see, that. Uh, they are exploited by, in this case, at least uh, two countries. And then uh, um, with the seven, again, other kind of squids that they spend the most of their um, life or the distribution in the XC, but the part also within the EZ. So the territorial waters of the country, this again may depend on environmental factors, may depend on the life cycle of the species and so on. And to conclude, the strident stock, which are even distribution. So, of course, it's very, all very nice from a biological point of view, and but it means that all these support fisheries, specific fisheries that need and they have to be managed. Now, we now we have in mind the WTO agreement on fishery subsidies, which is the most recent agreement related to fisheries and of a legally binding nature. But uh, I mean. Uh, um, the, the, the regulatory frameworks for um, fisheries, I mean, it's, uh, it's based on a portfolio of instruments. They, they are available and they're already there. Basically, all start with, uh, and I would like to refer now to the um, binding legal instruments, starting with the Jung clause, which is uh, the mother of the instrument, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, and its implementing agreement. So the United Nations Free Stock Agreement, we'll talk about it in a moment, the FAO Compliance Agreement, the last agreement, FAO Agreement on post state measure, which is binding, and it was just the last one prior to the WTO, WTO Agreement on Fisheries Subsidies, and the to force in 2015 or 16, I don't remember now, but I'm pleased to inform you that there are already more than 100 countries have ratified. And then there is another, in addition, I mean, agreements related to the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Scientist Convention on Migratory Species. Uh, I don't know if it's readable, just to give you an idea, the United Nations Free Stock Agreement again, is an implementing agreement of the Uncruz of Bonding Nature. Uh, so it's uh, about the management for the long-term conservation and sustainable use of spreading fish stocks and highly migratory fish stocks in the ABNJ. It's about the protection of biodiversity in the marine environment, the impact of fishing and other human activities on target stock and their ecosystem. It's about minimizing the impact of abandoned deer and reduction of bycatch support the application of the precautionary, precautionary approach. It's about this very important, the duties of flex state, or state, and cooperation among states. And I would also expand because, uh, also on market state and, and, uh, and into this picture. And, and the role is the pillar supporting the creation and the role of regional fisheries management organization. In addition, there is a, another a family of instruments that are very important. They are non-binding, they are of um, voluntary nature, but they are extremely uh, relevant. And uh, I would like just to mention here the Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries, adopted by the FAO Council in 1995. Is not binding, but the provision, the indication, and in many part of uh, the Code of for Responsible Fisheries have been included in the national fishery legislation of many countries across the world. And you can see this has generated a number of international plan of action, focusing on seabird sharks, uh, capacity and management, IU fishing, and technical guidelines. And then again, as a non binding, there are a number of uh, the resolution of the General Assembly in New York. Today. The guideline of the Commission on Biodiversity and so on, all of non-binding nature, but still element of the uh, uh, international uh, uh, fishery policy. So uh, let's focus then on the origin, 
and the rationale uh, supporting regional fishery bodies. Let's first consider and the non-binding instrument, the Code of Canon for Responsible Fishery, is Article 7. It's very clear. 713, uh, referring to transboundary stocks, spreading fish stocks, aggregatory fish stocks, basically on shared stocks. It uh, states that where these stocks are exploited by two or more states, the state concern should cooperate to ensure effective conservation and management of the resources. So the key word is cooperation. This should be achieved where appropriate through the establishment of a bilateral, sub-regional or regional fisheries organization or arrangement. This is a, a um, non-binding. Then, from another angle, and according to the international uh, law, um, we may, uh, may 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 wish to to refresh and to recall ourselves that the state freedom to sail fishing vessels flying their flag on the high sea is limited to some condition. For a state, and here I'm focusing on the responsibility and duties of flag state, they have the primary responsibility for controlling the fishing activities, activities of their vessel, both within the EZ, which of course is logical, as well on the IC. Flag and coastal state have the duty to cooperate, and this is the language that comes from the UNCLOS, uh, so as to ensure fishery sustainability and stock conservation. Concluding, the international communities considered as a main mechanism for organizing this cooperative management is through international bodies, such as regional fisheries management organization. And therefore, the Convention of the Law of the Sea invites states to create such organization where they do not exist. And this is continuing to reiterate over the years. The international community took it, this, uh, this uh, uh, indication very seriously because you can see here, over the years and uh, uh, in concomitant concurrence with the establishment of a uh, uh, fisheries instrument, the number of regional fishery bodies that have been established across the world. Yes, it has been increasing. Uh, just to clarify the, 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 the language that I'm using, I'm using the term regional fishery bodies to include both regional fisheries advisory body that have a role to provide technical and scientific advice to the uh, member, but their advice is uh, not binding. And regional officials management organization that have uh, the possibility to formulate and adopt conservation and management measures uh, for fisheries that are binding upon the contracting parties and also cooperating on contracting parties. So you can see an important increase in number of this regional mechanism. And this is the situation you may be familiar with this. Uh, Figure. This is the situation out there. I mean, uh, it's, uh, there is quite a, a universe of uh, regional mechanisms involving many countries from all across the world. How much this work as a network will be a matter of debate and uh, an important element to consider also for, for the future because uh, these are the pillars of the implementation of fishery policies uh, um, across the, the oceans. But as I say, it's a universe. And it's very heterogeneous. We have, starting from the top to the bottom, uh, if we go on the screen, these uh, regional fishery bodies, those that was an advisory coordination role, the regional fishery advisory body, versus those who have a regional fisheries um, regulatory management uh, mandate. Those focusing on inland water fisheries, those only on marine capture fisheries, or both. Those focusing on having the mandate capture fisheries, and it is not much known, is quite an important percentage focusing also on aquaculture, or even both capture fisheries and aquaculture. Many are of so called gen generic or geographic nature, meaning they have a mandate to manage all the fisheries resources in, in the regulatory area. Others are species specific the salmon bodies, the tuna bodies, and so on, they have a mandate to manage specific uh, species and the stock of specific species. 11 of them have been established under the FAO framework, so they are FAO bodies, 
And uh, uh, the others, of course, I'm talking about more than 50, but outside the FAO, still with the FAO, with the role as a depository, often or as a cooperating entity. And the recent trend is to establish new bodies outside the FAO. I'm sorry, they're not me particularly readable, but this uh, table it gives an idea about uh, the regional officials management organization we have at the moment. Their mandate, it has species specific or generic, and what is important, the coverage or regulatory area. So you may notice that the tuna bar is a regulatory area, which uh, is uh, by mandate, uh, it includes the occurrence area of the stock. It is it, and I see the geographic one or the generic one. Normally, it's uh, in many of the cases only on the IC, but with some exception that include also the EZ. Regional officials management organization of species specific nature with a mandate to manage uh, fisheries uh, um, um, targeting specific uh, species of stock. Um, I would like to bring your attention to the tuna bodies. And you can see that we have a very good coverage of from all across the world. Tuna bodies are basically cover the five tuna bodies, all the oceans of the world. If we have a look to the current geographical distribution of the regional fisheries management organization of generic nature that have a mandate to uh, regulate the fishery exploiting fishery resources in the regulatory area, you will see the pattern is a bit different. It's a good coverage, and there are also important areas of the ocean where there are not such a system. I'm referring to the generic one. And then a reality which is very relevant, in my opinion, should be considered, is the current coverage or regional fishery advisory body. They do not adopt binding conservation management measures, but they do they provide technical scientific advice to the member. They have an important role when they go to capacity building and so on. And then you can, and in some cases, they almost fill the gaps that we noticed before in the other slide concerning the generic regional fisheries management organization. Now, FAO historically uh, is supporting and working with regional fishery bodies. Obviously, as being regional fishery bodies, a key player when it comes to fisheries management which is, as you know, uh, one of the mandates of the, of the organization. And how we do this, we're doing this, uh, um, providing technical and administrative support to our regional fishery bodies, the one established under the provision of the FIO constitution, promoting collaboration and consultation among all the regional fishery bodies for arrangement of matters of common concern. And I'm going to develop this point in, in a moment facilitating the meetings of regional fishery bodies and management organization. Um, the FAO is committed to cooperate, to assist, to report on status and trend of fisheries, um, and then report to and lia um, liaise with the United Nations and other international regional organization regarding that collection and dissemination of information. Finally, the FAO is also involved when requested by the member in the process of establishing new regional fishery bodies, if so requested. The FAO is uh, supporting a unique tool, uh, which is gaining momentum visibility uh, during the last few years, that is the so-called Regional Fishery Body Secretariat Network. It's not an FAO body. It's supported by the FAO that provides venue for the meetings and the secretariat. And uh, what is this is a network of secretariats of regional fishery bodies. So it's an entity that doesn't deal with policy issue, but with technical issue concerning the mm, how regional fishery body they carry out their duties and, and they work. This is a unique coordination mechanism. Uh, absolutely, we bring it together 50, at the moment 58 key fishery and aquaculture players from across the globe. It has been established 20 years, 20 years ago uh, with the scope of promoting sustainable fishery and aquaculture to the support and fostering the learning and sharing of best practices on critical issues of common concern among regional fishery bodies, to uh, facilitate the unlock, unlocking of the potential regional cooperation for regional global fisheries governance, and then to um, focus on communication and visibility of regional fishery bodies work through 
to, to facilitate also the understanding knowledge of the work of regional fishery bodies, but not only within the community of fishery professional and, and the regional fishery bodies uh, themselves, but also to the public and civil society, which we believe it is quite important. You can see the FO organized uh, periodic uh, global meeting of the RSN. And as you can see, how is, uh, uh, the participation has been increasing over the years. Uh, basically, now we have every time in occasion of the Committee on Fisheries and a doc session on the RSN, and we have up to 80% original fishery bodies attend this session. So, this is a platform that uh, uh, may have an important role in the future, certainly as at the moment. These are some steps during the, the RSN. Um, during its life, I just bring to your attention that uh, together reflect and uh, and accommodate the need of a modern um, fishery policy instrument and uh, trends in fisheries management. Uh, during the last session, the terms of reference and the rule of procedure have been have been uh, revised and amended. What kind of product? Through the RSN and the Fishing and Aquaculture Division of the FAO, I mean, those are the typical technical publication, as in this one, which summarizes the performance, the work, original fishery bodies, and advisory body during the last basically 20 years. There is a magazine which is entirely contributed by the regional fishery body secretariat, which is again in popularity and visibility. There are monographic studies that are being prepared, there have been video in order to reach the public. Uh, and 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 to to let the, the international community and 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 the wider public uh, to know about the role and the functioning of the multilateral governance of fisheries. This video was presented at the UN headquarters a couple of years, three years ago. A kind of publication, and uh, you can see here, for instance, the last issue of the recent magazine, which is on the ecosystem approach to uh, to fisheries. Then we have examples of how through the recent regional fishery budget they cooperate at the time of the COVID. Thanks to this network, it was possible, and all this has been published, to assess almost real time the impact of COVID on the functioning of this body, and then therefore on the international governance of fisheries at the beginning of the COVID and after one year. All this was possible thanks to the regional fishery bodies cooperating through the RSN and with an FAO. And analytical studies, I'm not going to details, but of the kind of uh, the number of fish stocks which are regularly assessed, the number of fisheries, how many fish are managed by the RFMOS, the VMS system in place, and so on, the level of cooperation. All this is in the technical publication I've been showing to you before. Very important. When we talk about regional fishery bodies, in particular management organization, there is an important tool that the international community has developed, which is the performance review. It's the practice to, for the regional fisheries management organization to carry out external performance, performance review to assess the performance, sorry for the repetition, provide a recommendation that, uh, and this re review are public, uh, the most of them, provide a recommendation to better to, to, to advise the most of better um, <coughs> work. And FAO working with regional fishery, but used also to, to make kind of a compilation summarization of what are the outcome of, of uh, the performance review and the follow up action they've been taken or they have not been taken. And now, um, just going um, another important area, which is the, the last part of my talk, is that the the fish stock agreement the review conference has been reiterating over the years the need that this plate or regional fishery bodies you saw on the screen they should co cooperate among themselves it makes sense uh, to um, that they cooperate to optimize resources because of the distribution of the stocks and so on the committee on fishery of the field, which is the most important uh, forum when it goes to fish and aquaculture uh, policy and in several occasions and continuously highlight the key role or regional fishery management organization by the bodies in combating youth fishing and for the conservation and management of fisheries and the encourage the most increased cooperation. The central role in of these bodies uh, to implement international fishery instruments, the role they may have uh, to support the strengthen 
fisheries science, for instance, in addition to fisheries management and monitoring at both national and regional level, and therefore they should cooperate. And indeed, starting from last year, the uh, Fish and Aquaculture Division of the FAO, together with the BAS, has started to develop pilot experience, bringing together regional fisheries bodies from certain regions, this is the Western Indian Ocean, for instance, management organization advisory body, and uh, or from the Central Eastern Atlantic, where you um, bring it together bodies to highlight, identify areas where there is a good merit and scope to cooperate, to be more cost effective, to deliver a better service to the member countries or cooperating countries, to avoid also waste of resources, and also to better capture certain ecosystem dynamics and the species uh, productivity. As you can see, for instance, from the Atlantic, there is a plethora of bodies at the regional level, sub regional level, there that uh, said where coordination is uh, certainly necessary. It's also necessary for another uh, consideration. Um, this is the um, uh, West Africa coastal countries or developing countries. As you can see, they are member in the region to more than a region, one region of fishery bodies. This is a cost. And probably there could be a better way to improve the services this country may have from their membership uh, to, uh, to the membership in this, uh, 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 because of the multiple uh, membership. Therefore, more coordination and cooperation. This first experience has um, been summarized in this publication that has been presented to the, in New York uh, last, uh, last month. So, uh, concluding my part, um, it's evident that the advisory by the management organization has a key role in regional and global fishery and, and even aquaculture, in some cases, governance, promoting collaboration and joint action. The mandate or scope of regional fishery advisor by the management organization may be different, as well as the type of measure or decision they can take. The collaboration requires the issues of common concern. Trends in the um, the current trends in the activities and developments so advised by the monetary organization uh, provide evidence of the effort made that's being made by these bodies. And then, of course, I mean, this is a little bit maybe a uh, trivial consideration the effectiveness performance advised by the monetary organization depends on the commitment and political will of the member. A body, an RFMO, an advisory body, my particular RFMO, will be as much as 30 uh, and performing to as much is supported by its uh, member. Management organization and advisory body within the sphere of competence play a key role in the implementation of international fishing and fisheries rating instrument. I'd like to conclude before giving the floor for the last few slides to Aurora, just uh, reminding that the work that FAO has been doing to providing technical information to support the BBNJ process, also in cooperation with regional fishery bodies. And uh, you can see then uh, this product that will be available in all the UN languages that where the organization, I mean, has been informing delegate and negotiator for the BBNJ about what FAO is doing, what FAO can provide at the technical level within our mandate to support the, the negotiation and the future implementation in this case of uh, the, the BBNJ. Thank you very much, uh, dear uh, Dominic Denis. Yes, or Roman, please. Um, thank you very much, um, distinguished delegates, uh, dear colleagues. Now, we, after the presentation of my colleague, let, let's go to uh, how to put together FAO, RFMOs, and the agreement of fisheries subsidies. So, let's get first the, the whole picture. As you know better than me, um, there are 164 WTO members. Um, most of them are part of one, uh, are party to one RFMO, which means 80%, which is 132 states. If we go further, we find that we find that um, there are 74 um, WTO members parties to more than one. RFMOs, uh, which is almost half of the World Trade Organization, Thanks, please. But which is the role that FAO plays in, in all of this? So um, Piero has been anticipating part of that. In total, 
we have 22 RFMOs, no more, no, no less. Uh, this regional fishery manage, regional fisheries management organization, half of them, it means 11, have been created uh, by uh, uh, FAO under the FAO constitution. And the rest of them, which is 11, are part of the regional fishery body secretaries network. So basically, um, when you think of RFMOs, you have to think of uh, FAO, not only because half of them have been created um, under FAO constitution, but because they are putting together um, by this uh, network. Um, and this is extremely relevant uh, for several reasons. Not only because um, Piero is a secretary of the RSN, but uh, not only because the um, RFMO's um, official role in the conservation management measure, and they're able to make binding decisions, but because um, the collective areas within the regulatory competence of RFMOs include more than 90% of the areas beyond national jurisdiction. So you saw the map before, right? The map of these uh, uh, world oceans. So 90% of that is under the, uh, the, the mandate of the um, RFMOs. The areas beyond national jurisdiction, I just for uh, recalling, and these data are given by Jeff. Areas beyond national jurisdiction represents 70, 64% of the oceans. It means 40% of the surface of the planet and 95% of the volume. That's why next week, when the, this agreement will be adopted, this treaty, I don't know what will be the final form, um, is so important because most of the planet will be decided, will be um, regulated once and for all in this, in this future agreement. And, and that's um, why negotiators in the WTO of allow me this personal comment has been so smart to involve RFMOs. Uh, they have been very smart and very practical because um, they uh, now, thanks to this uh, agreement, RFMOs are going to play a key role on that. Why? Because they, they, they have the, the, the tools for doing so. They have the mandate, they have the tools, they have the experience. So um, in this agreement, um, there are three key articles where FMOs play a key role. The first of them, the, they have the authority, the, uh, the play a role in the prohibition to subsidize vessels or operators that are subject to IUU. So it means the determination of this IUU can be made by RFMOs. The second, which is in Article 4, is that um, RFMOs play a key role in how to spot the overfished areas and the operators. So imagine how much these people have to say on this. And finally, and more interesting, is in Article 5, where um, the prohibition to subsidize fishing on the unregulated high seas, it means where no fisheries management measure applies and there's no RFMOs in place. So it's a way to penalize um, this, uh, this situation. So can you see there are three areas where FMOs can play, let's say, a prohibition um, uh, on this the next slide. Then we have the second part, next slide, please, uh, is that um, RFMOs are also considered another part of the agreement. Uh, for example, in transparency. Why? Because uh, the agreement uh, is confident on the information that is going to be provided and by uh, RFMOs. So RFMOs are going to report. And believe me, they have the means to do so. Um, 
then they they also play a role in the institutional arrangements stated in Article 9. Why? Because the committee shall maintain close contact with FLO, but also uh, with the relevant RFMOs. And finally, um, and not less important, in the final provisions. Uh, Article 11 states that nothing in this agreement shall imply that a member is bound by measures or decisions or, or recognizes any RFMOs which is not party or not cooperative party. It makes sense. Why? Because by the end of the day, you are the sovereignty state, and the sovereignty can never be touched by no means, despite the huge role that now RFMOs are going to play. The sovereignty of states have to be considered and primarily taken into account. Um, let me close this presentation um, by recalling um, one letter that maybe you, you remember. And um, before MC12, um, the um, review of the, the magazine is the science published a letter by 300 prominent scientists, um, which uh, encouraged the member states to sign and adopt uh, the agreement. This was made uh, a few months before MC12, and they closed the letter with this line. WTO members must harness their political mandate to protect the health of the ocean and well-being of society. I assure you that if you go to any basic text, any policy text of any RFMO, you will find those lines. That's why there are this coherence and this uh, match between the goal of uh, this agreement, FMOs, and of course, FAO. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aurora. Thank you so much, uh, Piero, for indeed uh, this very uh, comprehensive and uh, informative presentation. Uh, just to say that I've seen people taking pictures of slides, etc. We will make sure that you get all the that all participants uh, and all those who have registered to the event got all the, the material. Uh, there are already a number of questions coming up in the, in the Q&A module. Uh, we will distribute the, this question at the end of the, of the session, but I would like to encourage you to, uh, to keep uh, asking your questions so that we will indeed respond to, uh, to exactly what you what you want and not use my uh, generic spare questions that I have in case there is none. So there are many, so we will uh, we'll go for that. Uh, but now I think we'll be moving to the to the panel discussion and where we will hear more about perspective and experience from our speakers on the role of RFMOs in regional and global ocean uh, governance and fisheries uh, sustainability. Uh, and first, we are going to Mr. Manel, uh, and Mr. Manel will uh, will provide the, the perspective of the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas on the role of RFMOs in ocean governance and fisheries sustainability. Uh, Mr. Manel, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Dominic for uh, this invitation and uh, also for Frau, all of your team, uh, for giving us the opportunity, I mean, to get more involved in these uh, discussions. Um, uh, so I would like uh, to share with uh, all of you some um, um, views or information on ICAT on what we are doing as an uh, organization. So, uh, we started uh, since uh, 57 uh, years ago, so we just celebrated our uh, birthday. Uh, Mr. Manel, Mr. Manel, can you please clo speak closer to the mic because okay. it's very difficult. So I don't know whether you can hear me clearly. Please don't I'm having... Please don't thank you. <laughs> Sorry? Can you uh, raise your voice a little bit, perhaps? Okay, so uh, I 
don't know. I'm quite very close to the mic of my headset. Uh, maybe I don't understand so the technical problem we are we are having. Uh, please tell me that you can hear me loud and clear now. It's better, it's better. Keep raising okay. your voice. Be okay. So I will be shouting then. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so that you hear you from wherever you are. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. So I was saying that we just celebrated a month ago our 57th uh, anniversary. We exactly one month ago, so 14th of May. So in uh, 1966, so we had our convention. And uh, so that convention has been... Uh, uh, the amendment has been adopted by the commission uh, in nine, uh, 2019 and uh, is being uh, pending uh, um, a formal adoption with a number of ratifications. So we will have a new one in which we have more uh, incorporated, uh, so the ecosystem, formally the ecosystem approach, and we have broadened our scope of uh, species coverage uh, going to uh, large uh, uh, sharks, uh, oceanic ones, and also um, so we have been um, implementing more and more so the ecosystem approach to fisheries. So those were, I mean, the necessary changes, amendments, mainly in the new convention amendment. And uh, so we we are now uh, fifty two uh, contracting. Uh, parties with uh, another five cooperating because we have that status co cooperating uh, members and uh, formally um, so the contracting members in, in total we are 57 cpcs that we are calling and our main objective is still to maintain the population of tuna and tuna like species i will come back to uh, so the some uh, details about so the tuna like species uh, but uh, to maintain them, their population at a maximum sustainable catch for food and other purposes. This is what we are working on every day. And now, so we are covering more than oh, close to 40 species now, and also manages uh, shark species that are now, although we have, we did not, uh, they were not formally um, embedded in the first uh, convention. Now we are having uh, formally ratification of uh, a number of CPCs. Um, so we are taking measures on uh, other, um, uh, also other bycatch species like seabirds and sea turtles also, we are working on those. And of course in total, so at the time being, we are having around uh, 150 reporting requirements. I will come back to that very briefly between management and uh, and scientific one. And we have also a lot of vessels around 18,000 that uh, could in our records and that could significantly um, increase during a certain fishing season. So how we are, our commission that is meeting every, every on a regular meeting every two years. And uh, so we have a, sp a special meeting almost uh, every year. So every two years also. So meaning that we have on an annual basis, we have a meeting, either it is a regular meeting or a special one. This year we will be welcoming you uh, all if you wish uh, in Cairo uh, in November. Uh, so we have also, so the, the SCRS, the standing committee, which is, and statistics, which is, uh, um, backing or supporting all our decisions before any decision is uh, decisions are taken we have also the conservation and management uh, measure compliance committee so uh, which is all so meeting every time intercession and annual one uh, the standing committee on finance and administration uh, the permanent working group on the improvement of uh, ICAT statistic and conservation measure. We were just in Japan last week for uh, such a meeting in order to prepare so the decisions to come uh, this this year, of course. Uh, so we are having also so a, a, a dialogue working group between scientists and managers that help because of the technical 
um, and difficulties, uh, challenges of the science uh, work. So uh, the commission agreed to have a dialogue between you know, the scientists and managers in order to better understand each other from both parts and uh, make uh, the decisions easier. And we are having so four panels. Uh, so the panel one, tropical tuna, the panel two, so the northern uh, um, uh, tuners, uh, northern temperate tuners. So the panel three, southern temperate tuners, uh, only one species and on that one. So the, the albacore, southern albacore. And we have a panel four with uh, all other species. So including swordfish, billfishes, and uh, small tuners. And of course, now as we are having sharks, they are uh, taken into account there. Uh, continuing to 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 improve uh, with a lot of working group, for example. So the and uh, this is linked to the uh, uh, the fight against IUU. This is which is a very strong component of our work uh, because in uh, any type of measures you may take. If it's not properly implemented, so you're losing sort of benefit of it, and you will never be able to achieve uh, any any success, of course. So that's why it's so a strong um, uh, uh, focus is put on the fight against IUU fishing. So we are having, for example, in the bluefin tuna, we're having so the electronic uh, bluefin catch documentation that is tracking. Uh, all the bluefin, bluefin tuna from the capture, I mean, I should say to the any restaurant or to the to the table. We have uh, different working group that are now working. So we would like, uh, we are working on extending so that capture documentation, documentation scheme uh, to other species. Uh, we had also last week a meeting on that, the progress of that working group. Uh, we will be having our first uh, climate change expert group uh, in, uh, in, in July, early July, uh, in order to see how uh, climate is impacting. We had some works at uh, uh, scientific level, but it was not at that uh, scope uh, the commission wishes to tackle that uh, issue now. Uh, so we are having so an, uh, a working group also and to see how we can uh, better deal with the electronic monitoring sub, uh, system to support so still uh, the work on the uh, monitoring uh, surveillance and control measures. We have the port inspection expert group for capacity building and assistance also, because this is a big challenge. I will be insisting on uh, capacity building also in, in this, because uh, when you are having all these uh, many um, requirements, so that needs a capacity be, be, uh, uh, behind in order to, to implement proper, properly and uh, um, abide by the different and uh, complicated, um, I should say, because we have received many times some complaints from uh, uh, some CPCs that are saying that we, we cannot follow because it's too much. <laughs> we can tec cannot technically uh, follow because of the magnitude of uh, of its works. But it's uh, what it is, and the commission has agreed to continue having uh, improving so the capacity uh, of particularly the developing countries, uh, which is something very very uh, important for the commission. Uh, and I uh, used to give an example saying uh, it was a quote by the uh, late uh, uh, Fabio Hazin, you may know, uh, from Brazil. So he was saying and uh, uh, calling the attention of the commission saying that uh, you need at least a, a, a master's degree or a PhD to be able to follow uh, sort of different requirements of the commission. Just uh, insisting on the complexity of it and the need to increase so the capacity uh, of the developing countries in order to address properly so the various requirements that are uh, taken by the commission. And um, also we are having um, uh, cooperating much and Piero has uh, mentioned that and I think that this is uh, 
uh, an important issue to the cooperation with other organizations. So we are with the similar sister organization, the Tuna ones. We are regularly in, in contact and exchanging um, a lot of uh, um, uh, documents and practices also, because we have in many cases, so the same members belonging to our organization that are also members to others organization. So I, as Perry Piero uh, mentioned, so this is a key uh, issue and it is a regular topic in uh, on our um, annual meeting. So we are having a review of the cooperation and the commission is still encouraging. Uh, so more and more cooperation with relevant organization to see how uh, we further, because we are working in an ecosystem, you cannot be isolated. We are sharing the same ocean, sharing, and as I said, incorporating our um, ecosystem approach. So it requires more engagement and more cooperation with other organizations that are dealing with other species also that are not covered specifically by ICAT. Um, and uh, so this is uh, a key important things. And I would like just to share if uh, you will also, uh, uh, touch base again, uh, if I may say so, uh, with the capacity building. It is a key element uh, of our, uh, of our, in, in ICAT, uh, because uh, more than 75% of uh, our members are from developing countries. And uh, usually over there, so following properly and addressing and even respond, um, uh, responding regularly on a satisfactory manner so to the various requirements I was referring to, it's a big challenge. It is a big challenge because we are having more than 140. So, and, uh, and every year it is increasing because the commission is taking new measures, adding to what uh, previously so they have. And uh, so this is uh, a big challenge, uh, but the commission uh, in line with uh, all uh, what is uh, being done at other international fora also encouraging this participation and even having a support uh, budget uh, uh, through the uh, meeting participation fund to encourage at least the sort of adequate participation of uh, countries that are facing, I mean, budget challenges when it comes to uh, attend uh, relevant meetings. So in, uh, this we are working with uh, uh, those developing countries to assist as much as possible because we have a part of that regular of that uh, meeting participation fund which is based on the regular budget, and we are counting also on uh, significant voluntary contribution from developed countries that is uh, really helping. Uh, to increase so the, the capacity of developing countries. But, but still, it's not uh, that enough. We are having more and more uh, calls, but the, the commission is uh, keeping on insisting on this because it's a, a key element in the success or the achievement of the, uh, the different goals we are uh, having. And uh, of course, also we are uh, to give an example of uh, one success because if all of this has been uh, uh, put in place, uh, is going uh, smoothly. I just would like to share that uh, with you, the, an, an example of uh, a success. So we have, it is our biggest one. And uh, just to show that management, if uh, conducted properly, so could lead to very successful results. And uh, so this is, uh, you may know that, you may notice, or you may heard about it already. So it is the case of the um, Eastern and Mediterranean, Mediterranean bluefin tuna. So uh, back to 2006, so the situation was uh, really, uh, I'm not going to say a disaster, but it was uh, a bad status of the stock. So, and the stock were, I mean, qualified on the verge uh, of collapse. But uh, unfortunately, no, fortunately though, so the, the commission took very strong measures. That was difficult for many uh, countries and they, because they have to, to change internally and to face some uh, uh, 
and to take some stronger measures that are very unpopular usually because uh, all good measures after this situation are usually uh, not popular. But the commission uh, did manage and uh, took, uh, uh, had adopted a recovery plan uh, in many years following 2008, 10, 12, 14, and uh, until 2017. So, and fortunately, so the, it was successful because we could have uh, those measures taken, tackled specifically capacity limitation, regional observer program, so joint inspection scheme also with uh, the EBCD I was referring to, the electronic um, uh, bluefin tuna catch documentation scheme that was uh, the things that made uh, the recovery so successful and in 2018 so we had a recovery uh, plan uh, that changed uh, that that came uh, to to subdue um, to replace so the, uh, uh, the no that recovery plan was changed to a management plan because the stock has recovered uh, since uh, 2018. And this was very uh, significant and showing, and it has uh, uh, given a lot of lessons uh, uh, to, uh, I mean, to learn from. And even now, so last year, so the commission uh, uh, adopted uh, a management procedure um, in this new, system of managing. So the management and strategy evaluation and harvest control rules. So we could adopt a management procedure for bluefin tuna, just giving more stability and more anticipation in uh, the management in comparison to the classical one based on just to so the, uh, uh, the stock assessment. But this Mr. time we are can, can I ask you to have your last word, please? Because I think it has been a very comprehensive presentation, but we still have one speaker and then we'd like to allow some time for questions at the end. So okay. Yeah, I've just, just to concluding, I would like to finish this, uh, uh, giving this example of uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, uh, bluefin tuna that we have uh, showing that we can succeed in uh, taking uh, measures that are adopted by by all of us and uh, it will be uh, followed and a lot of lessons uh, as i said just uh, 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 taken from that uh, learned from that this experience and is kind of spilling over to other species that we are following uh, kind of similar processes um, uh, and uh, there are some two challenges, if you allow, is just uh, to improve, as I said uh, earlier, so the, the capacity building and also the participation uh, in, uh, in uh, the work of the commission in meetings and in other things, the active participation, I should say. So this is one of the challenges the commission is working. And you may notice, and we have noticed it from uh, to our part, for example, those who are participating in the BBNJ processes in other uh, global processes are not the same that are, I mean, de delegation speaking, are not the same that are participating use, usually in our meeting. Many of them, I'm not me meaning that it is, I mean, 100% uh, uh, so the case offered, but we have noticed many of them were not aware even of the other processes. So this is a kind of a challenge that we are having in order to encourage, continue to encourage the, the internal consultation in order to have a clear understanding of all. So I would like to stop on uh, this and uh, hoping that uh, uh, we will have opportunity to discuss more about so these uh, first elements. So I wanted to share with you. Over to you, Dominic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Manel, for such a, a comprehensive presentation, which indeed good, gives, uh, I think, a very good idea of the of the activities of the of ICAT uh, under your, your leadership, and uh, and uh, and indeed, your, I very much like your your focus among the many activities on capacity building and uh, uh, the role you have in. Uh, building capacities of members to, to handle these rather complex uh, matters, but also uh, ending with your very concrete example of the success. Okay, if we manage properly here is the type of success we can have. 
and uh, the Eastern Mediterranean bluefin story is a very telling one, and, uh, one that we need to uh, definitely uh, publicize. So uh, thank you again, and uh, I would invite you also, Mr. Manel, to look at the questions that have come up in the Q&A, because we'll come, up, we'll come back to you uh, with that, as well as to our colleagues, FAO colleagues. But now, uh, let me move to Mr. McFarlane, uh, will provide us with a national perspective on New Zealand experience as a member of several RFMOs on their role in ocean governance and sustainability. Mr. McFarlane, the floor is yours. Thank you for being patient and uh, <laughs> being the, the last of our speaker. Over to you. And, uh, and, and thank you very much. And thank you for the, for the opportunity to, uh, to talk about the, the experience uh, from the other side of the world. Uh, in the southern hemisphere and um, in a in a time zone uh, with a, with a ten hour difference, uh, we're ahead of you. Uh, that's 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 our winning uh, strategy and and uh, dealing with this. Um, so um, I I enjoyed the references at the beginning uh, to the um, World Trade Organization's fishery subsidies arrangement uh, agreement because Article 5.1, no member shall grant or maintain subsidies provided to fishing or fishing related activities outside the jurisdiction of a coastal member or a coastal non-member and outside the competence of a relevant RFMO or arrangement. Is an important measure in that agreement in that it recognizes that fisheries management is a responsibility of coastal states in the first instance, and then can only be achieved in the high seas for the range of fisheries which you so well described by the formation of regional arrangements. And where we have therefore areas of the high seas where there are no regional arrangements, and that may be geographic, or it may be in, in relation to the competence of the RFMO and the species that the that RFMOs choose to manage. The other species which may be targeted or may be bycatch species or may have been fished in areas where there are no RFMOs are effectively in a situation of non-management. And in those circumstances, the WTO members agreed by consensus that it was inappropriate to permit the uh, membership to be able to um, provide subsidies for that sort of fishing. So for New Zealand, we are a member of four uh, regional fisheries um, agreements. And um, our agreements that we're involved with are the, um, conven the Convention for the Conservation of Atlantic, uh, oh, sorry, Antarctic Marine Living Resources, CAMELAR, the South Pacific Regional Fisheries Management Organization, the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Com Commission or Convention, and the uh, Convention for the Conservation of Southern Bluefin Tuna. And they are very, very different organizations even though their primary function and their primary purpose is very similar. CAMELAR, uh, as an organization, um, has its primary attention to the fisheries of the Antarctic and primarily the Antarctic high seas, uh, but its overarching interest, as far as we are concerned in New Zealand, re is related to the two species of toothfish, uh, Patagonian toothfish and Antarctic toothfish, which do occur not only in the, within the Antarctic zone of convergence, which is largely the area of Kamala, but out in the high seas beyond that, uh, that area uh, and within the economic zones of some of the coastal states of the um, southern, southern hemisphere. Um, and to a degree, Kamala has an oversight, at least as far as the trade, uh, in all um, uh, toothfish species is concerned. The South Pacific Regional Fisheries Management Organization was established uh, um, in 2006 uh, to manage the, uh, all of the non-tuna fisheries resources of the high seas, um, and that includes straddling stocks in the high seas, uh, from the uh, west coast of uh, South America, um, roughly from the equator south, um, all the way across the Pacific 
uh, through past New Zealand, past, uh, past uh, the Southern Ocean to the very southwest tip of Australia. Uh, so it's a vast area of the ocean, uh, but its primary attention currently is focused on squid uh, on the um, uh, eastern side of the Pacific uh, along the uh, west coast of, uh, of South America. Uh, the uh, deep sea resources, which are predominantly fished in and around the high seas areas uh, uh, near to New Zealand and Australia, uh, and increasingly an interest in the squid fisheries uh, of the uh, of the um, uh, South East Atlantic, uh, Southeast Pacific. Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission um, uh, manages the highly migratory species of the Western and Central Pacific uh, from a midpoint across the Pacific um, to uh, the uh, really the crossover zone to the Indian Ocean. Uh, so it includes Indonesia and the Philippines um, and through to the coastal um, um, area of, of uh, Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, within that, a very large part of the Western and Central Pacific um, area is covered by the intersecting economic zones of Pacific Island, small island Pacific um, states. And so therefore the Western and Central Pacific uh, Fisheries Commission governs those highly migratory resources within the economic zones uh, of those uh, of those member states, as well as um, into the high seas pockets uh, of the Western and Central Pacific, and then the uh, the, the the high seas areas um, in 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 and around uh, the, um, the the Southwest Pacific Island states, and the conservation for um, uh, Southern Bluefin Tuna um, Agreement um, focuses almost entirely on Southern Bluefin Tuna. Uh, as a global species, but primarily located um, in the southern hemisphere, as you would expect, um, from uh, the Pacific, um, uh, south of Australia, um, and up into the Indian Ocean, um, and uh, with a spawning area that, that occurs um, in Indonesia. So the mandate and coverage of those organizations is different. The way in which they go about their business is different, um, but they all have a number of elements in common while also having areas of specialization and difference as well. Um, so in terms of addressing fisheries management, they all define and authorize fishing. And they all endeavor to set catch limits uh, and monitor fishing activity. But they don't all allocate um, quota among their members. The, the, the particular standout of that is the, um, is the Camelar arra arrangement, um, which is really um, uh, otherwise a, um, it's a more complex agreement than just a, um, a regional fisheries management organization. And, and Camelar doesn't like to, re to refer to itself as a regional fisheries management organization, but it does carry out those functions. There is no allocation uh, of the fishing rights for um, uh, for for um, uh, toothfish among the parties to Camelar, it's an Olympic fishery, which is very tightly controlled and monitored uh, through daily reporting um, and real time reporting to the Secretariat, um, who will who run an algorithm um, and then will open and close the fishery um, uh, according to uh, their calculations of how much fish has been caught and. What uh, quantum of catch uh, will be with the um, with the number of sets which are in the water at a particular time, um, and it's a very successful arrangement uh, in in so doing. But it does have one drawback, and that is that because it's an Olympic fishery, there is a tendency for the fishery to occur early in the season uh, and to fish to the maximum uh, um, allowable catch, uh, which is set at a very precautionary level. Uh, and then the fishery can be over and done with um, in, a, in a very short period of time. It's already a very small window of fishing because of the um, it occurring in the summer ice-free season, uh, which is really from uh, the turn of the year um, through to early March at the, at the latest. But most of the fishing has, has um, been completed by the end of January. Um, 
the uh, the RFMOs um, all uh, endeavour to address environmental impacts of fishing um, uh, on endangered and threatened uh, species, other species. But the South Pacific RFMO and Camelar uh, both have particular attention to the impacts of fishing on the seafloor and the organisms that live on the seafloor, um, so-called vulnerable marine ecosystems. Uh, and uh, as a result of that attention, and in, and in Sprifmo's case, they have very strict um, uh, limits on uh, where fishing can occur. So it is possible for, and, and have been proven by, by these regional arrangements, for spatial management measures to be agreed and for areas of the high seas to be placed off limits to fishing and to fishing to be very, very tightly confined. Uh, to areas where, potent, where the potential for impact on vulnerable marine, marine ecosystems can be minimised. Um, they also have, have interests in lost and damaged gear, um, and that's a particular concern in, in Camelar, which is a fishery conducted by the longline method, where if gear is lost, it will continue to ghost fish uh, for, um, un until such time as the, as the gear sort of finally deteriorates. Um, an emerging issue for all of the regional fisheries organisations uh, that we're involved with is addressing climate change and the potential impact of climate change on the fisheries. And it is a particular concern for the Western and Central Pacific Commission uh, who are dealing with uh, an expectation uh, with, uh, with global warming um, and with climate change uh, that stock abundance is likely to move. It may not change markedly, but it is likely to move spatially uh, and migrate gradually eastwards. Um, and that is of considerable concern to the Western uh, Pacific Island states uh, for whom uh, fishing activity in their economic zone under um, access arrangements is of, uh, of, of significance, of considerable economic significance. All of the agreements um, address IUU fishing in a variety of ways. They all authorize fishing. They all maintain records of vessels, including support vessels. Um, but um, a number, um, particularly Camelar and, um, or actually Camelar and CCSBT, um, have um, catch control uh, measures and catch monitoring, catch documentation, and trade documentation. Uh, so that they can be assured uh, that the fish that is entering international trade um, has been sourced from uh, legal and authorised sources uh, and that it is not being contaminated by the introduction of, uh, of fish that may have not been uh, sourced from legal and authorised fisheries. So they operate a gradual disappearance model uh, to monitor uh, the, the trade um, both through to further processing and final and to final market consumption. Um, and uh, that um, is of interest to the Western and Central Pacific uh, Fisheries Commission who have been exploring uh, the possibility of, of uh, developing a catch certification system as well. There are common issues which I'll just touch on very briefly in relation to the way in which um, Regional fisheries organisations, and this is a common problem to re, re, or common challenge to regional fisheries organisations the world over, um, which is how to how to go through the process of of decision making. All of the regional organisations that we're party to endeavour to reach agreement by consensus, and some are governed entirely by a very strict interpretation of consensus and for example that applies to Camelar. It only takes one member to disagree uh, and a measure will not be adopted. Um, the uh, SPRIFMO um, constitution on the other hand uh, having recognized that as being a challenge uh, for regional fisheries organizations um, set about a uh, to establish within the convention uh, text um, a, a voting procedure which uh, can be carried by a qualified majority of members and that requires that parties who um, do not agree with the majority of members nonetheless while they may object 
um, are required to institute equivalent measures to the measures which have been agreed uh, by the parties to, uh, to, to, to the Commission. Um, uh, the, um, the final issue uh, that I just want to touch on is the issue of transparency um, and uh, transparency and, and in, that, in that sense, all of the um, organisations have very active websites, uh, very active publication of the data uh, and decision making and conservation and management measures uh, that they have agreed to. Uh, so criticisms uh, that RFMOs are closed shops uh, and can't be seen into um, by uh, by other parties and people on the outside of those organisations really um, cannot be sustained uh, on the basis of the information that those regional organisations make available uh, to uh, anybody with an interest. And I think I'll conclude at that point. Thank you. Thank you, thank you indeed very much, Mr. McFarlane, for giving the New Zealand perspective and for especially focusing on the what you see as the, the role of the, the four RFMOs of which you are members, highlighting their difference in mandate, uh, coverage, operational procedures, but also the, the level of specialization and the common activities and issues on which they are they are working. So uh, thank you very much for that. We we are we are almost at the end of the meeting, but we are willing to to extend a little bit um, because there are a number of, uh, of very interesting questions that have been uh, that have been uh, put in the in the Q and A module. Uh, but perhaps I can start here uh, in Rome uh, to have a, to give a, a, an advantage to those who have uh, taken the effort to come to the to the palais. Uh, this morning, uh, so question to from the room here, and then we'll go to the the few uh, Q and A. So, please, if you can say where we are, where you are from, and to whom your question is addressed, would be good. Thank you. I think thank you so much. Thank you so much for the advantage given to me after being here. <laughs> so uh, indeed, uh, but to, to save the time, I will just ask one question, though I do have more questions indeed. But, but there will be opportunities after. Yes, of course. So I will ju just only focus on one question. Uh, I appreciate your mentioning the fisheries, agree uh, fisheries subsidies agreement of WTO, and you especially, uh, you especially focus on the role of uh, IMFOs in that agreement. And as you know, we are discussing now the COF, the overcapacity and overfishing pillar of this agreement. So what do you think can be RMF or, or RMFO or RFMA's role in this pillar? For example, like uh, uh, stock assessment, like uh, uh, because uh, just now the, the, the gentleman, Mr. Marrow, mentioned the development uh, element in, in the uh, RFMO. So uh, how, how do you think RMFOs can play a role in the OCOF pillar, such as uh, stock assessment or uh, special uh, or uh, uh, needs of developing uh, countries and so on? Thank you very much. Okay, this is one question. And oh, sorry, uh, I, I forgot to mention, I'm from the uh, mission of China to the WTO. Okay, well, <laughs> one welcome, one welcome. And uh, just for the colleagues uh, here, we have a, almost a, a related question from uh, from Norway, I understand, which uh, which also refers to the OCOF, and, uh, and which is about, uh, which is, uh, can the FAO assist the WTO members and is their burden to communicate marine capture data and the status of fish stocks also based on info information for, from the RFB as well as from individual countries' economies? So it's a somehow related question, but let's see if there are other comments, questions here. No? Just yes. Yes, one very short. Uh, I'm of France. from France. Um, you mentioned that in the current agreement, uh, Article uh, 8 on transparency, um, can you just uh, confirm um, the notifications will be from members exclusively, but they will uh, include information from RFMOs? Is that your understanding? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Pierre, will you start? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. So, yes. 
I refer to the question of the distinguished delegate from China, which is also connected to a question from Norway. From Norway. Um, yeah, the issue, Norway was facing on the issue of the burden on data reporting which is a serious issue, because we all agreed that there is a reporting for many countries, reporting in the future to the WTO, reporting to the FAO fisheries, because countries, FAO is mandated to collect the statistics, but they have to be reported by the countries, reporting because of SDG, and then uh, uh, monitoring, and for the, you know, the SDG 14, of course, reporting because of the BBNJ treaty agreement, that's, that's coming, not tomorrow, but as soon as it went into force. Um, as you know, FAO is mandated to collect statistics that have to be provided by the countries. One of the problems, for instance, is that uh, capture fishery statistics. Uh, some countries are not requested to split them according to what is produced in the, in the territory it's at and what outside. This is one limiting factor that uh, the community has been uh, discussing. Uh, certainly, uh, regional fishery bodies, I believe, NFMOs, if they contract in parties, even a mandate, because NFMOs then they will just perform according to what the contracting parties ask and support together with the FAO, also using that platform that I showed to you, the regional official by the Secretary of Network, may assist when it goes too easily to be the burden or reporting or to standardize it also to make it usable as much as possible. Um, and on the issue concerning, yes, even in the future, I do believe that, uh, we do believe in FAO that uh, RFMOs, you know, not RFMOs are not all the same. We had excellent experience here of ICAP, SPREFMO, and so on. We are really a very interesting cases. Other RFMOs are struggling, uh, because this is also on the, 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 the reality. So some is an FAO well placed even in the future to continue assisting with the determination of the status of stocks or resources within the regulatory area, which is already contemplated now. I mean, others may need, uh, may need support uh, and also may be to lobby uh, to, uh, to work more in partnership with the advisory body as well. That we tend to forget that this reality of advisory body I mean uh, the potential that may be uh, used for in, uh, in the future. So I think this uh, you, Aurora, you want to add something? Um, yes. Um, yes. To, question of France. Um, just to remind you regarding the, the, the stock assessments that in the governance of uh, RFMOs, there's always a scientific committee. So the, the basic, basic uh, uh, subsidiary body is always the, the scientific committee where they put most of their resources. Why? because they need to get the best available scientific information. And remember what he just said, um, FMOs are composed by states. So it's the same state that sits with the FAO and the same states that uh, take part at WTO. So by the end of the day, we are at the complete uh, governmental level. So we, we cannot start differentiating so much because in the, by the end of the day, we are talking about the same thing of this highly institutional governmental level. I don't know if that is easy. Okay, uh, yes, one more. I would actually, if you allow, I have a question for Mr. McFarlane because he, he, he said that New Zealand is a member to four uh, RFMOs, right? And um, what I'm not such an expert, so what I don't understand yet is whether it is possible that these different RFMOs have conflicting or at least different uh, requirements for uh, the same species. Or so, do you ever run into situations where you say, okay? We'll just adhere to the strictest regulation that is <laughs> available for this and this. Fortunately, I don't think that that um, that situation has arisen. Um, I don't know if it's arisen anywhere else in the world, but because the mandates of the four um, entities are really quite different from each other, um, uh, uh, that um, that has not. Um, arisen. Uh, but to give you a, a, an ex a sort of a positive example, 
the CCSBT, the Southern Bluefin Tuna uh, arrangement, obviously the uh, there are bycatch of other species uh, from uh, in tuna longlining than just uh, Southern Bluefin Tuna. Uh, and so in that circumstance, the management arrangements and measures, um, if they apply in the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, um, are the ones that would apply to that activity, uh, whereas our CCSBT confines its attention to Southern Bluefin Tuna. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have a, a question also to um, uh, Mr. Manel. Uh, well, there are many questions. <laughs> we'll not be able to answer all, but we will uh, we'll answer uh, offline and make sure that it is covered in the, in the report uh, we sent uh, to everyone. So uh, this is a question from an OECD colleague uh, who is asking, um, Mr. Manel, if you could provide more information on the work that your organization is doing on sharks and the type of conversation and management measures that are adopted and if they are binding for contracting and cooperating parties. Anyway, did you, you got the question, Mr. Manning? More information uh, the work, on the work of your organization in relation to shark and the type of management measures that are adopted and if they are binding, if they are binding for contracting and cooperating parties. Over to you. Yes, uh, good. Uh... Okay, again, uh, thank you for that uh, that question. So so far, what we have been doing is uh, so the sharks were bycatch in ICAT. So, but uh, still, before long, long time, we have never neglected it, and it has been uh, also a key uh, element of the uh, of the uh, the uh, the commission. To, to tackle this issue because it's not uh, I mean uh, new or don't have to be to be neglected also so that is why many many uh, work have been specifically uh, directed to 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 sharks and uh, so you can uh, you would see for example uh, that lastly so the uh, a lot of discussion on the on 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 the sharks specifically. And uh, if you you allow, so it is, uh, for example, uh, on the short fin macro. So you have got a lot, a lot of work that have been done. And uh, so one year ago, so there have been uh, a conclusion of something that was not discussed. And it comes that uh, the commission came to uh, a specific measure on this going beyond, for example, uh, so the, uh, uh, the 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 call for cooperation and the call for uh, specifically uh, calling members to to kind of cooperate more, but it comes to uh, something binding. As uh, uh, I do not recall what we are calling, we have recommendations are binding for us and uh, all the um, resolutions are not binding. But specifically for the, those uh, uh, measures on checks, so you have binding measures that are that are there. On on uh, those measure, uh, the I can say, uh, um, the species of uh, of the the uh, that are related to to all bycatch. So we have uh, so this generic. I was just so the this generic, uh, uh, I mean, uh, measures on uh, on those uh, bike on those bike cuts, and and uh, if I may, uh, for example, lastly, um, uh, said for example, so the the different recommendation only on on uh, the the sharks, so you have all the recommendation, and I, as I said, they are mandatory. On the Southern uh, Atlantic Blue Blue Shark uh, Coating Association, if I say every time Coating Association is because of we consider those as bycatch. 
quote in association with uh, ICAT fisheries. On, uh, so the, uh, the, on the Atlantic blue sharks also caught in Atlantis for the conservation of North Atlantic blue sin. We have the South and the North uh, Atlantic blue shark uh, that are caught in association with our uh, uh, fisheries. This for the short fin macro, so we have it in 20, as I said, two, two years ago, 2021. So uh, conservation measures have been uh, taken for specifically for that uh, uh, short fin macro and it's a recommendation binding also. Uh, so you have uh, uh, also uh, some uh, elements on the uh, uh, the conservation. It's a general a general one since uh, 2018. Uh, so a review of the conservation and management regarding so the sharks that are generally caught within uh, uh, ICAT. But you have specifically, so these north and south uh, blue sharks and you have uh, so the short fin marco that are recently, uh, that recommendation which has recently been taken. And these are, if I uh, may repeat, they are binding. Also, it's not, it was not, I mean, on the main uh, targeted, targeted species of our fisheries, because considered as bycatch. But with the uh, new uh, amendment, if it enter, it enters into force, so we will be having, so those completely on board on our main uh, species, not considered as bycatch. Thank you. Thank I don't you know, very much. That's a summary of a response, but we can yeah. uh, give more details uh, later on. No, very good, very, very comprehensive uh, indeed. Um, and, and thank you for all the, the clarifications. Well, we have received many, uh, many questions, many, uh, uh, many comments. We'll make sure it is well captured and, uh, and that it is reflected uh, in, um, in, the, in the report. We will be uh, sending. Um, uh, I think now we have reached the end. I mean, we are already 15 minutes over time. So I think we'll conclude and make sure that you get the, the, the feedback. There are very important questions that have been uh, posted uh, online. We'll aim to, to respond to them. But, um, and to be honest, I mean, this is one of the seminars where I've seen I mean, we have organized dozens of those, but this is the one where the level of interaction has been very, uh, very intense and where there has been actually quite a large number of participants from government and mission online, as well as a few here in the, in the room. Uh, today, of course, we have heard about the, the importance of, uh, of establishing a collaborative and cooperative framework to promote global cooperation and foster international and regional initiatives to secure responsible fisheries. And uh, in this context, our discussion touched upon the important role of regional fisheries management organization in fisheries management. Uh, we also heard uh, more about FAO's role in promoting and supporting uh, our FMOs. Uh, the involvement of our organization in establishing many of these organizations and implementing the processes required for the sustainable management of shared uh, resources. Uh, while concluding, I would like to once again express our very sincere appreciation to uh, Mr. Mark Farnane, Mr. Manuel, Piero and uh, you, Aurora, uh, for, uh, for taking the effort to, uh, to be with us and, uh, and share your, your perspective. I think it was, uh, it was uh, very good. Uh, before closing, I would like to make a, a, a small commercial uh, to say that uh, basically, as the FAO liaison office in Geneva, and as I said, we have the, this uh, fisheries uh, uh, dialogue series. And we are planning to have uh, the next one uh, tentatively on the 27th of July uh, to, uh, with a focus on uh, IUU uh, fishing. And uh, we will be sharing the details of this upcoming session in due time, of course. And I would like also to, uh, to tell you that as part of our work, I mean, we are producing a number of uh, policy briefs ahead of uh, MC13 and uh, there will be a number of policy briefs uh, prepared that they are actually being prepared on uh, on fisheries uh, in the context of this package 
which will improve the number on agriculture and the number of on uh, fisheries. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you once more for, for participating in today's session and wish you a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you again, Mr. McFarlane. So late. <laughs> no problem. Bye-bye.